Joining us next, a guy that knows MLS Team USA inside out. We're really grateful to have on once again, Matthew Doyle. Matthew, welcome, my friend. Hey, it's good to be back. How are you doing? Very good. Appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. Matthew, let's get right to it. I had Jeff Carlisle on Monday night of ESPN. Everyone knows Jeff Carlisle. And I warned Jeff. I warned Jeff. I said, I believe if they lose this game to Costa Rica, that I believe they will have a strong, strong chance of missing the World Cup in Russia. He wasn't so sure about that. I now, after watching that, I'm almost 99.9% .9 sure their backs are up against the wall. They might have to go to a playoff. Your thoughts? Oh, I mean, I, I think it moved it closer to, to that being the reality. Um, but look, the, the hexagonal is 10 games long. We're 20% of the way into it. Uh, two of the three toughest games now are, are out of the way, if you want to look at it like that. And uh, honestly, I think if the U.S. just takes care of business at home uh, and gets a couple of results on the road, I'm not even talking wins, just a couple of ties, uh, that'll probably be good enough to, to sneak into third place. Now, that's a step backwards for this program. That is a step backwards from, from what we've been for the last uh, 20 years almost, uh, and it's certainly... Uh, underachieving relative to um, to the talent on the roster, but I, I I would I would hesitate to make any uh, 99.9% guarantees uh, about where the team will finish up at this point. But uh, certainly it's, it's a it's a lousy start for the U.S. So let's talk about a lousy game that John Brooks had. For me, it was an unbelievable performance by him. But not only him alone. Timmy Chandler again looked to me out of sorts. I mean, Omar Gonzalez looked okay in certain spurts. Matt Beasler uh, looked all right. But Brooks, to me, looked absolutely horrible all game long. They were, they were all bad, but I think Brooks had the single worst game uh, that I've ever seen a U.S. defender play, uh, which is <laughs> kind of stunning when you look at his pedigree and the game. I mean, he, this is a guy who is a veteran of the Bundesliga. He, he's a veteran of the 2014 World Cup. He was arguably the best defender in the tournament this summer at Copa America, uh, and he <laughs> he was terrible. He was you could have taken any uh, you know random college defender and, and thrown him into the game, and probably would have done better than uh, than Brooks did. And uh, look, Jurgen Klinsmann threw threw the guy under the bus on Friday after the loss to Mexico, uh, and then backed the bus over him backwards and then ran him over again going forwards, which is what Jurgen Klinsmann does. Uh, and I, I have to assume that uh, that was not unrelated to, uh, to how Brooks played. Uh, and this is, look, uh, I mean, the player has to take step forward and take full responsibility for it, uh, but the coach keeps taking good players and, and putting them in these positions. And sooner or later, you have to point the finger at the coach. And I'm glad you said that. Let's look at Josie Altador and Michael Bradley selfishly here uh, from Toronto FC's point of view. These guys have had an unbelievable season, a positive season, a real good season all around since game one up until now, this conference final. They get to the national team, honestly, Matthew, I think as if they've been given a special drink uh, that that, that <laughs> changes them into something we haven't seen before. So to me, that tells you a telling sign about Jurgen Klinsmann. I'll tell you something. I got a text message from a former MLS coach uh, at 6.30 in the morning this morning from Italy. And he basically said to me, he said, Anthony, why is Jurgen trying to reinvent the wheel time and time again? I had no answer, Matthew. You? Uh, no. I, I, no. No no explanation. I, I think the answer is that uh, he's, he's a very bad coach. Uh, he, he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't really understand how to uh, build a team. Uh, and this is the, the pattern that has uh, persisted, both with the U.S. and with Bayern Munich. And look, everybody points to what happened in, in Germany in 2006 with that World Cup team. But he was on the verge of being fired about two or three months before the World Cup even happened uh, until Balak and, and Lam and, and a few others uh, took him aside in practice and said, enough tinkering. We're going to play a straight 4-4-2. You're not going to change the lineup. You're not going to take the formation. And, and Klinsman knew that his job was on the line, so he basically let the players in Yugi Love call the shots. He got out of the way. It was just the, the figurehead. Uh, and once that happened, Germany played like Germany. Uh, and, and Klinsman 
uh, had precious little to do with it. And if you read Lom's autobiography, uh, you know, that, that much is obvious. But uh, as always, he was really eager to take credit for it afterwards, and he has parlayed that into uh, this, uh, this career that he's had. And, and uh, he's basically stolen uh, about $10 million from the U.S. Soccer Federation. I, I, I got to tell you, I, I think you could you know, line up all 20 MLS coaches in the room, throw a rock blindfolded, and hit someone who's a better coach than Jurgen Klinsmann. Well, oh, abso- absolutely. I had Robin Fraser on, the assistant to, uh, to Greg Vanny and TFC on the show Monday night after Jeff Carlisle. I'd take him over Jurgen Klinsmann any day because he understands what he has uh, uh, in front of him. He understands the capabilities of his players to me I said this time and time again I don't know if you know if this has taken place or not I sure don't know about this but why wouldn't Michael Bradley break down the door of the office of Jurgen Klinsmann and say to him just like you said enough is enough we're the players we're the ones that understand what we need to do let's play a formation that we are comfortable with let's play with the players that we know uh, 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 and understand each other has Michael done that and if not is it time I don't know if he has done that. I mean, there were definitely rumors that uh, a bunch of the veteran leaders of the team uh, sat down with Klinsman before the Copa America and said, you, you got to stop screwing with this. We, we, we need to have a core. We need to have uh, some clarity. And that led to us playing, <clears throat> I think, our, our best, uh, the best we've played under since Jurgen took over was that Copa America. And obviously now things have changed and, and reverted back to, uh, to the sort of mad scientist ways, um, but I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think Jurgen would respect that. I, I think that he he showed with the Landon Donovan thing uh, and the Benny Failhaber thing uh, that he he doesn't really respect American players, <clears throat> and he doesn't. Uh, he certainly doesn't have any time for anyone who would who would question uh, anything about his uh, tactical. Or, or man management approach, uh, and it's you know it, you, you get the you get the national team coach that you deserve, and uh, given how uh, given the inferiority complex that, that seems to govern the people at the top at the USSF and uh, a lot of the fan base, uh, we've always lusted after having a European coach with a big name, uh, and this is what we've got, uh, and you know we've made our bed, and we just. We have to lie in it. When does the heat start coming directly on Sunil Galati? When does he start taking responsibility for where they're at now and how much the program has fallen down? Because I'll tell you, Matthew, the last World Cup, I've talked to some World Cup coaches in the last World Cup after it was over, and I said to them, I truly believed in my heart of hearts the USA would get to a Final Four mm-hmm. World Cup, whether Russia or Qatar. I believe that. I still can kind of say that I still believe that. But to me, Sunil Galati is stubborn in a way that he won't see the big picture and say, it's time for a change. And I'd actually go knock on the door and say, please, Bruce Arena, we need your help to get out of this. Come back and give us a hand. Well, I mean, there are talks of that that might be what's happening. I I assume that that Galati is finally taking a good hard look uh, at everything that's transpired under Klinsman. Um, But as for when that pressure it's Galati himself. I mean, it does come from certain areas, but this is, you know, the, the U.S., for as much as the fan base has grown or for as invested as people are, uh, you probably interview 100, 100 soccer fans, and, and maybe five of them would know who Sunil Galati is. So he, he's, he's able to avoid, uh, he's able to avoid that type of scrutiny. Um, even though you're right, he, he does absolutely deserve it. Lastly, before I let you go, Matthew, uh, again, speaking from a Toronto angle, I, I believe a lot of TFC supporters, management, everyone, might be just a touch, I mean a touch concern of the mental state of Joe Cialtor and Michael Bradley because of the last two games they went through. Obviously, they're professionals. They're going to turn off the switch, turn it on to the club and the big challenge in the Canadian Derby. But I, I'm a bit concerned as well because we're not talking two heartbreak losses. We're talking one lopsided one and one on home on home soil. That's got to stick in their mind a bit, you? I mean, it, it's two historic losses is how I would put it for, for different reasons, but I think equally painful. And uh, I, I mean, I, I think you just have to trust that both guys are veterans. Both guys have been through 
uh, some bad losses and some bad moments and have consistently come back to their club and uh, and performed well, uh, especially lately. So I, I don't, I, I wouldn't get too hung up on that. Uh, if I was a TFC fan, uh, I, I think, I think those of us south of the border have a uh, have more to worry about these days, uh, just because the U.S. is such a mess. I think I think TFC is fine. Matthew, thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule. And for the first time in a very, very long time up here in Canada, we've got a smirky smile saying, now you know how it feels in a little bit of a way because we've been through this so many times. And, you know, I feel for you, but a lot of us up here are kind of a little bit of enjoying it as well, Matthew, I got to tell you. <laughs> Matthew, well, there's nothing, nothing like schadenfreude to get you through the week, I guess. Absolutely. Matthew, thank you so much. Really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. You're making time. God bless and enjoy the rest of your night. You too. Take care.